Hello, I'm Ben Chu. And I'm Lizzie Burden. And welcome to The Green Recovery, brought to you by Project Syndicate. Few events in human history have had such fast and near universal impact as the coronavirus pandemic. Around the world, governments, businesses and ordinary people have found themselves confronted by a set of challenges which, in most cases, they never imagined facing. But can we find a way to rebuild that tackles what's shaping up to be the next great crisis to face humanity and something we've been warned about for decades now, climate change? Over the next two days, we'll be exploring solutions to that challenge with a lineup that includes heads of state, Nobel laureates, and many more. Tomorrow, we'll be hearing from Abiy Ahmed, Prime Minister of Ethiopia and winner of the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. We'll also be joined by Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, who played a key role in coordinating the global response to the 2008 financial crisis. We'll also have Kevin Rudd, Australian Prime Minister at the same time and under whose stewardship Australia became one of the few countries in the world to avoid a late 2000s recession. And then later today, we'll be hearing from former Colombian President and Nobel Peace Prize winner Juan Manuel Santos and others on what can be done to tackle the alarming loss to biodiversity around the world, thought to be the most severe loss of species since the dinosaur extinction. But to kick things off, we're going to start by looking at green dealing, what governments around the world can be doing to help build a green recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. Joining us for this session is as qualified a lineup as you could imagine. Mary Robinson is the former president of Ireland, current chair of the Elders and patron of the International Science Council. Her work on climate change has seen her author books, work as the UN Special Envoy, set up her own foundation for climate justice and much, much more. Joseph Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize winning economist, best selling author and former chief economist at the World Bank. If that wasn't enough, he was also the lead author of the IPCC's second report, which framed climate change in socio-economic terms. We also have Carlos Lopez, one of Africa's best known economists. He currently holds positions at the University of Cape Town, Sciences Po and Chatham House. We'll be hearing from them in just a couple of minutes, but first let's remind ourselves of the issue. Now, if you'd like to join the conversation or help spread the word over the next two days, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag TheGreenRecovery. In just a few more moments, we'll be coming to our panel. But first, here's Werner Hoyer, president of the European Investment Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to address this forum on a critical issue of our time, the green recovery. In these extraordinary times, there will be increased pressures to trade off a green for a brown recovery. While a swift drop bridge recovery in Europe and globally is imperative and cannot be compromised, we can no longer prevaricate when it comes to the dual climate and environmental emergencies. Climate change is not slowing, and neither is biodiversity and ecosystem loss. The latest United Nations emissions gap report is clear. We must reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% this decade. So there cannot be any return to business as usual. Simply, there is no time. The EIB Group, the largest global multilateral financier of climate action, stands ready to play its part. In November 2019, we committed 
to ending our financing of unabated fossil fuel energy, to aligning all financing activities with the goals of the Paris Agreement by the end of this year, to dedicating at least 50% of EIB financing to climate action and environmental sustainability by 2025, and to supporting 1 trillion euro of climate and environmental investment in this decade. And our responses to the pandemic have been framed by these commitments. We are a key partner in the recovery plan for Europe. Our largest initiative, the Pan-European Guarantee Fund, will support up to 200 billion euro of financing with a focus on SMEs, the backbone of Europe's real economy. Outside the EU, we are stepping up our support to developing countries, communities and companies, not only in COVID-19 relief, but in building resilience and financing low carbon investment. One example is the City Climate Finance Gap Fund to be operationalized this month, which will support cities in developing countries in implementing their climate projects. We can expect investment to be depressed in the foreseeable future. It took a decade for European business investment to recover from the global financial crisis. We know that the huge investment gaps that we could see before the virus in climate, digitalization, skills, infrastructure will widen, but we know where they are and we can support the efforts to bridge them. While crucial, the public sector alone cannot take the entire burden of leading our economies toward a green recovery. The required acceleration will depend on deep technological changes, the way markets will be shaped, and critically on private sector engagement. To this end, we have contributed to the landmark EU taxonomy for sustainable finance by establishing clear, robust definitions of green investments with disclosure and reporting requirements Transparency and accountability, the taxonomy will help channeling financial resources towards the multitude of projects needed for decarbonization and avoid greenwashing. Under the taxonomy, the term green will apply to investments contributing substantially to averting the climate and environmental emergencies. If we consider the worsening polar ice melt, droughts, hurricanes, and forest fires around the world, the kilometer wide islands of plastics in our oceans, then we know that the climate and environmental crises are speeding up. If ever there was a time to avoid greenwashing, it is now. The younger generation has made it clear. They need a perspective in a world which is sustainable. We must turn our pandemic recovery into a defining successful moment in our fight against climate change and environmental degradation. Thank you very much. That was Werner Hoyer, president of the European Investment Bank. Now, in half an hour, we'll be hearing questions from journalists around the world. But first, I'd like to start with you, Professor Stiglitz. In your opinion, what's the scale of government spending necessary to tackle climate change? Some estimates are that the US needs $1 trillion every year. Can you put that into context for our audience? What's actually necessary? Well, it's a huge amount of investment because it has to affect every sector of our economy. Uh, we need uh, infrastructure, including transportation, public transportation. Uh, we need uh, housing, uh, real estate, commercial real estate. Uh, it, it actually embraces every a, a redesign, a retrofit uh, of every aspect of the economy. Often when we think about green, we think about moving from coal energy sources to renewable uh, energy sources. That's an important part, but there are all these other aspects that we also have to make investments in. Mm. But I wonder if you think that spending on climate change is too politicized. Is it too associated with the redistribution of wealth, for example? Well, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think you can separate the two. Uh, the fact is that we do know that uh, climate will have a particularly adverse effect on the poor, especially in the developing countries. So environmental justice is very linked with uh, social justice, with economic justice. The, the two are really uh, inseparable. In the United States, we have a particular problem because uh, of the politics of climate that one of the parties has been taken over, uh, as it were, by uh, skeptics of science, not just climate science, but skeptics of science itself. And uh, for reasons uh, you can say uh, having to do with, with 
with the influence of the energy sector, um, uh, perhaps uh, special interests. Uh, the party has become aligned with climate skepticism. I think this is temporary because an awful lot of the mainstream members of that party will eventually have to come to terms with reality. If I can come to you now, Mary Robinson, staying on the subject of scale, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around Green New Deals, echoing the huge measures taken under Franklin Roosevelt in the US in the Great Depression. You can see from this archive footage people in the 1930s marching in favor of it. In your opinion, is any government on earth currently engaged at the necessary level? I think it really is very important that we see full engagement, not just on a Green New Deal, but on the protecting of biodiversity. And I would like to see a closer working relationship between the two big international frameworks, the Climate Paris Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, I think it's interesting that the European Union is actually moving in the right direction. It has a Green New Deal, it has a strategy for biological for diversity, and it has the farm to fork approach, uh, you know, improving the common agricultural policy. And today we heard Ursula van Leyen give what I thought was a real leadership speech for her State of the Union. I mean, she said some rather interesting things. She said she, she criticized the limits of a system that values wealth above well-being. Uh, you know, that's interesting from somebody in her position. And I'm part of um, a, a, a high-level steering committee for the Campaign for Nature about protecting 30% of the land and 30% of the oceans by 2050 for economic reasons, as well as for nature-based reasons, um, because this will enable jobs, it will enable a much better future. But I don't think we see enough discussion either at country level or at international level bringing together the major frameworks um, that help us to devise the policies and help, including the private sector, to, to make the, the right commitments. And Mary Robinson, what's stopping the rest of the world following Europe's lead? I think there's a political problem, to be honest. Obviously, it's worse um, in where Joe Stiglitz is in the United States because President Trump uh, has threatened to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. He can't do that, in fact, until the 4th of November, 2020, and it's interesting that the election is on the 3rd of November, and um, Vice President Biden has made it clear he would recommit uh, the United States, and I believe he would recommit strongly. So uh, we'll wait and see how that plays out. But it, it is a political problem, and it requires um, a very big engagement of people, and we're beginning to see that, led, I have to say, and I say it with joy, led by children. The Fridays for Future, under Greta Thunberg and the millions of children and the young people who are engaged, the way they've um, it required in the United States on the democratic platform, a much more green deal than would otherwise be there. And we see it in Europe, as I said, we see it in Africa. I'm sure Carlos Lopez will speak about this. We see you know, people stepping up, including women leaders, stepping up to say, we have to come out of this devastating COVID with a green recovery, with green stimulus packages, but I also say with nature-based and protecting 30% of the land and 30% of the oceans. And that's of a scale that would be really significant. And Carlos Lopez, how's Africa doing on the Green New Deal? Well, uh, I would not say that we have an African Green Deal, but certainly the discussion in Africa is very much focusing on how can we pursue structural transformation of our economies with respect for uh, the characteristics that we know are affecting uh, our climate uh, adaptation. Uh, you see, uh, 2020 for us is going to be remembered not just as a year of COVID, but also as a year where climate change really had a tremendous impact in the well-being of people. We had droughts in the uh, Southern Africa region. We had uh, locust invasions in East Africa. We have now floods in most of Africa, both uh, in the Sahel and parts of Eastern Africa and uh, the Nile Basin. So you, you have really the demonstration that climate is not a looming crisis, it's the real crisis that we are living 
right now. And I think this has mobilized people really to combine the two crises and to see that we have to get out of the conundrum that we are, transform uh, the politics and transform the economies of our countries will require tackling issues such as the ones that were reminded by COVID, like for instance, inequality has been demonstrated in a way that was much more exacerbated by COVID, but also you know, take advantage of the opportunities that we can afford to change the way we deal with fossil fuels. For instance, most countries in Africa still have subsidies for fossil fuels, and this is the great opportunity to get rid of them, not only because the prices of oil are really at the floor, but also because renewables are now very competitive. So in this afternoon's session, we'll be looking at solutions to tackling the alarming loss of biodiversity around the planet. With opening remarks from former Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos and another absolutely outstanding panel. So please stay tuned for that. But now I want to turn to solutions regarding green investment. Mary Robinson, first of all, um, Carlos touched on this. When you were thinking about public investment in the face of climate, we tend to think about uh, mitigation, trying to stop it happening. But do we perhaps need to start talking about investment for a, to enable us to adapt to a warmer planet as well? Very much so. And actually, the private sector, some of it, is really beginning to step up. I've been involved with the B team of business leaders who are trying to give a leadership across the board on not just climate, but how we completely change our economic system. And I value the fact they're doing that. But look at what the Climate Action 100 Plus are doing. And these are investors with $47 trillion in assets. And they're a group of more than 500 investment firms. And they've just called on some of the world's biggest polluters to be more aggressive in reducing their uh, emissions and in introducing plans which bring them to zero carbon. They've asked people like ExxonMobil and Rio Tinto, what are your plans? What are you going to do? And they're going to next year publish a net zero company benchmark, which will tell investors what companies to invest in and not. Now, if we can stop the money, that will be very significant. That's been the problem. And I mean, Mark Carney has been leading on, you know, both transparency, but now needing more than that, needing measures to stop companies from investing in fossil fuel. Mm. Now, I want to turn to you, Joe Stiglitz. I want to unpack a little bit exactly how, in your opinion, states should be investing uh, practically to tackle climate change? What are the most useful measures do you think they can introduce here and now? Barack Obama's bailout for the, in the financial crisis funded at least one major green initiative that proved problematic, a $500 million loan to Solyndra, a now defunct solar company. Is the lesson from that episode, perhaps, that simply getting out the checkbook isn't always the solution? I think that's a wrong interpretation of that particular episode. All R&D is going to be risky. Uh, you know, uh, the problem is moments that we haven't taken as much risk. The challenge of climate change is so large that we will have to try a, a lot of different things. We're going into a new world, and that means there will be some successes, uh, but also some failures. I think the important thing about uh, these investments is they will have to be massive and they will have to be compre comprehensive. Uh, I talked before about uh, uh, the importance of infrastructure, uh, public transportation systems. Uh, what's interesting about that are those are investments that can do three things at one time. They can help stimulate the economy uh, by providing public transportation that connect poorer people with jobs. They can help promote equality, and they reduce our carbon footprint. So. That's the essential thing as we think at this moment about a green recovery. We are going to have to make sure that all the money we spend serves multiple purposes. And that means they have to promote uh, uh, a green recovery. Uh, they have to address the enormous inequities uh, that we had before the pandemic, but have been exercised, uh, exacerbated by the pandemic. And Joe Stiglitz, again, I mean, there could be a new president in November. Do you sense that Joe Biden is ready to go on this agenda? Has he got the programme ready to be implemented, do you think? 
very much so. Uh, I think, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of I's to dot and uh, T's to cross. There are a lot of details to be worked out. But the commitment to uh, a Green New Deal, uh, but it's more than a Green New Deal in the sense of investment. It's also about regulations, providing incentives uh, to businesses to, to move in a green direction, uh, discouragement, discouraging them from moving in a brown direction. Uh, so it's a whole package of policies, and uh, all of these things are on the table. I want to turn to you now, Carlos Lopez, and in particular tap your expertise on Africa. Um, we're going to see a map shortly which shows electricity production around the world from renewable sources. Uh, the darker parts on the map show the places with the highest renewable uses and that sub-Saharan Africa actually has the highest concentration anywhere on the planet. Is this an area actually where the rest of the world can learn from Africa? Well, this is very encouraging that Africans have realized that if they want to address the deficit of access to power, which is the largest in the world, they could do it by taking advantage of the fact that they are the first region that is attaining uh, the level of industrialization that others have gone through at a time where they can do it in a different way, uh, with renewables first, but also to access some of the social needs relating to uh, uh, power, including uh, infrastructure and mobility, uh, you can do it now with renewables at a very good price. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of countries have now put this as a, as a reference and as a priority. And we are very encouraged also by the fact that if you look into the challenges that Africa has to face in the coming decades, you have the challenge of agriculture and how we are going to establish a much better base for food security. And then you can do it in a completely different way by making sustainable agriculture and agri-tech your priority. If you look into the challenge of urbanization, we have about 800 million people that are going to be living in addition in the cities by 2050. You can also do uh, cities in a completely different way. If you look into the energy transition, the same. So we have really an opportunity by being latecomers. Let me put this to you, uh, Joe Stick, that's on the subject of Africa, though. Do Western and Asian countries have a moral obligation to provide Africa with funds to deal with the climate crisis, perhaps schemes such as uh, debt reduction for carbon reduction deals? Very much so. And, and to put it in, in moral terms, uh, the fact is you can think of the uh, planet as having a certain amount of carbon capacity, uh, how much can the atmosphere uh, absorb in greenhouse gases? And the advanced countries have used far more than their share of that carbon capacity, uh, leaving very little left for those who are being slow in the development uh, trajectory. So uh, as compensation, for the fact that we've used up that carbon space, we have a moral obligation to help uh, the uh, those countries that have been behind, like like, uh, like those in Africa, uh, to uh, move to a green economy. And I think uh, carbon uh, debt for equity, uh, carbon swaps, are are a mechanism for doing that. And Mary Robinson, would you agree with that? I mean, what is uh, the West's practical things that they should be doing for Africa at the moment? Is it debt reduction, carbon swaps? What's your view? I think all of that in one sense, because I come from the perspective of justice, climate justice, and I look at the injustices of climate change, and they very much affect Africa, but also beyond Africa. Look at the layers of injustice, the first layer being that it disproportionately affects the smallest country, the poorest countries and communities who are not responsible. Um, secondly, there's the gender dimension. It's women and girls who are affected disproportionately as they are by COVID. Um, thirdly, it's the intergenerational injustice, which children have reminded us of. Fourthly, it's the injustice of pathways to development, which Carlos Lopez could talk about very eloquently. <clears throat> the developed world, the industrialized world, we built our economies on fossil fuel. We have to wean off. But developing countries have to develop with clean energy, and they need the investment, they need the jobs, the training, etc. And the last injustice is the one I'm trying to emphasize in this discussion, the injustice to nature, the loss of biodiversity, and the financial reasons to 
ensure that the recovery package, the stimulus um, to protected areas could generate significant economic activity. It could generate nature-based tourism. It could generate um, the um, protection against flooding. All the local communities that I work with and talk to want their work to be valued because it is nature-based and they don't see that value coming through. Mm. <laughs> nature-based tourism is an interesting one. Would you like to see more Europeans uh, visiting Africa, going on holiday there? Uh, how does that fit in with uh, aviation emission reduction? I definitely think we'll all be flying less. I personally have made a real commitment. And um, now that I can Zoom like this, I will only go if I'm absolutely needed to go. And maybe once a year, I'll take a break with my family and go somewhere um, because I'm lucky enough to be able to afford that, but that would be it. And I would definitely try to go nature-based um, if I can, but we need to cut down completely on the aviation industry. We have to rethink that. It can't go on as before, as we have to rethink so much. I mean, COVID is devastating, but it broke a system that would have been even more devastating for our world. And that's what we have to keep thinking. Business as usual was going to be devastating for future generations, and indeed in quite a short time span for current generations as well who are young. So, you know, we were, were, were stimulated, if you like, into having to think differently. And that's why I think uh, we need to link more and not be in silos. Um, I was very much a climate envoy for the Paris Agreement. I didn't think as much about biodiversity. I do now. I think about both. And that's the way we need to go. Now, don't forget to join the conversation and help spread the word over the next two days. And please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. I want to turn now to the obstacles to green investment. Joseph Stiglitz, the fiscal response to COVID-19 provided a great opportunity to push through a Green New Deal agenda. So why were only 4% of measures brought in by G20 countries green, according to Oxford University? Well, I think part of the reason has to do with uh, there was such a rush to spend money uh, to s support the economy that there just wasn't a lot of thinking. And that was especially true uh, in the United States, which was the largest spender. Remember, we spent $3 trillion. And as we were spending that money, there was, there was, there was no vision of the post-pandemic economy. In the United States, we had an additional problem <clears throat> that the Republicans, uh, the president, the Senate, uh, actually are, are antithetical to a green recovery. Uh, there are really good models out there. Uh, what Frank's did in terms of putting uh, conditions on any assistance that it gave to the airlines and say you have to reduce your carbon footprint. What New Zealand did where they said, we ought to redeploy underutilized resources, people, uh, waitresses and waiters that were losing their jobs, rather than just to have them sit at home, let's use them to uh, make uh, our national parks uh, more sustainable. So invest in uh, a green economy, just like we did in the New Deal. The Civilian Conservation Corps in the New Deal has left a legacy from which we have benefited for now uh, 90 years. But what about brown investment uh, that's actually making damage to the economy? That should be prohibited, obviously. I, I mean, I, I think that uh, the level of expenditures is so high that uh, we as citizens ought to have a right to say, how is it shaping our economy? It shouldn't be a blank check. We are <clears throat> spending money to shape the economy in a way that we've never done before. And we need to shape it in ways that accord with our values. And <clears throat> uh, this echoes what uh, Mary said a few minutes ago about well-being, not just wealth. And part of our well-being is a green recovery, and that, that's why it's so important that we make that money serve double or triple duty. 
Mary Robinson, as uh, Professor Stiglitz says, we've seen the largest ever expansion of state st spending in peacetime. Um, and we've got no real idea when the pandemic will end and more rescue packages might yet be needed. And that money will need to be paid back at some stage. So doesn't that put enormous constraints on the ability of governments to spend more now on climate change? Well, I think what we want to see is that the recovery money will be spent in an intelligent way that fosters a green recovery. And I was actually, again, pleased with what Ursula von Leyen said today in her State of the Union speech. First of all, she committed the EU to reducing emissions by 55%. That's up from, by 2030, that's up from 40%. That will put countries like my country, Ireland, at the pin of our collar, but it's great. It, it, it's really meaningful. And then 30% um, of the recovery package, the 750 billion, um, uh, will come from green bonds, and 37% uh, will um, uh, be uh, um, uh, will be um, green uh, deal objectives to fund green deal objectives. Now that's the first time we've seen um, that particular number, if you like. You know, 37%. I wish it was more, but it's significant. So uh, we're we're really seeing um, the kind of change we need to see. And yes, there probably will have to be future packages. They need to be even more geared to green recovery. And then we need, and we're going to have a big AU EU summit at the end of October, and we're going to see the European Union have to be in a very equal relationship with the African continent, something I've been longing for, and I know Carlos Lopez has, um, you know, a different kind of relationship, which sees that the two continents have a, a future in common, and it has to be green. Mm. Putting aside the financial and political constraints, Mary Robinson, how much of a problem is it that there's a limit on how many shovel-ready projects there are? I don't think that that is going to be as much of a limit if we are more imaginative. I mean, another thing that was in that speech, which I think is really worth thinking about, was a commitment to a European Bauhaus. Now, I think I remember post the First World War, there was a Bauhaus um, about, but this one is for uh, co-creation, a co-creation platform for um, uh, for architects, for artists, for designers um, to design Europe to become a climate-free zone. Uh, sorry, a, 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 a climate zero zone, if I could put it that way. Now that is very exciting because that's the infrastructure that Joe was referencing, but it's a real commitment to new design, new ideas, um, in order that we can move forward. And I think that's, that's exciting. Mm. Carlos Lopez, you've worked across the UN, including at UNDP, where climate change has been a huge priority in recent years. With the arrival of COVID-19, inevitably there's been a huge amount of focus on dealing with the pandemic. Is there a danger that COVID's crowded out the climate issue? No, I, I don't think so. If anything, I believe that uh, COVID has actually just uh, highlighted a certain number of aspects of the climate agenda. Uh, particularly in Africa, I, I see the connection between the two uh, very vividly uh, in the way people are dealing with the crisis response. For instance, a lot of the most affected Africans by COVID where for reasons that have more to do with uh, confinements, lockdown, social distancing rules, affecting economic activity more than the sanitary dimension of the crisis. And therefore the debate has been more economic than sanitary uh, in the continent with maybe the exception of South Africa that has about half of the cases of infections uh, due to COVID. But what I think it's important to also uh, underline is the fact that in the African debate, uh, COVID has just demonstrated the level of cynicism of the international community in relation to funding a response to this crisis. Because Africa really uh, is not debating how to deal with different stimulus packages. Africa is actually confronted with the fact that there is no liquidity available and, and for reasons that have to do a lot, not with the management that was uh, actually being thought as pretty good in the last uh, two decades and much better than before. 
uh, but rather external factors. And nobody really is helping Africa the way it is being proclaimed. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the G20 uh, debt uh, moratorium uh, that has been announced so far has translated into $1.2 billion, which is like, you know, a joke. Uh, and nothing else really has happened uh, of significance. Yes, an unfunny joke. Um, now, tomorrow we'll be keeping the conversation going uh, with a session on whether green business is good business, uh, with opening remarks from former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, followed by our final session, Closing the Circuit, looking at how we can transition to green energy, which will have opening remarks from former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, and another great panel discussion. But now I want to talk about overcoming some of those obstacles to green investment. First of all, Mary Robinson, most of the world's richest countries, the ones with the greatest capacity for green investment, are democracies. Yet we see, for example, with the yellow vest protesters in France, that there is opposition to uh, green investment when it can impact on people's livelihoods. What's the way to get people on side, do you think? The way to get people on side is to be on the side of justice. Um, the Gilets Jaunes, the, the, green, the um, yellow vest um, protest in France was not against the environment. It was against the injustice of removing a wealth tax and then putting a tax on um, travel for people who were poor without any distinction, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. In other words, loading the low income with the burden. And it was seen to be unfair. That's, that was the, the cause of the protest. And uh, we do need to bear in mind, as I said, the layers of injustice and to address those layers of injustice in, in, in coming out of this. And uh, I think that, you know, we need a just transition also for the workers in the industries that have to be uh, let go, starting with coal. We should have no new coal. What about coal workers? They built up economies, they worked hard. They deserve to be part of the future, either with being pensioned off if they're a certain age or if they're younger, having retraining and a particular focus on providing jobs in the communities concerned. We're seeing this in some countries. Spain has been quite good in working with the trade union movement, in putting up a big sum for, for, for a climate justice fund. Now the EU has a climate justice fund, I'm very glad to say. That's going to be part of the future, a just transition as we move forward. Joseph Stiglitz, I wonder if I can ask you, how much do you think Donald Trump's appeal has been based on his rejection of the science of climate change. Is that what's driving his popularity to the extent he, to which he is popular, or is it mainly something else? Oh, it's mainly something else. A lot of it has to do with what Mary was talking about, a sense of, uh, of injustice. Uh, people who worked hard uh, but uh, have limited education and are uh, seeing their future prospects not looking particularly good, uh, a sense that the system is rigged. Uh, so it's a, it's a broader sense of grievance without hope. And uh, I think you know, what Mary said is absolutely right. Uh, we have to give people opportunities and hope. So if they lose their jobs as coal miners, uh, if, particularly if they're young, create new jobs. Uh, like the installation of uh, solar panels. Uh, we need to emphasize that there are a lot more jobs in the installation of solar panels than there are in the coal industry. So overall, the basic thing is the green transition can be a growth story with employment opportunities. Uh, it won't happen on its own. Uh, you know, as another example, uh, we were talking a minute ago about the yellow vest. I was up in that part of France uh, uh, a year ago, this time of year, and, and talking to people. One of the things was very clear is uh, they had the the public transportation system. Uh, the trains had been either disbanded or made uh, 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 much more infrequent. Uh, they had to use cars. If we had a public transportation system that really worked, that connected uh, people in these areas with their jobs, uh, that would alleviate uh, their concern about uh, having to pay more for their gasoline. So the real thing is we, the, the awareness of how 
the cl climate crisis, the pandemic, and the previous uh, deindustrialization crisis has all affected different people in our society differently. Uh, and unfortunately, the same people have had to pay a price in each of these crises. And so what we really need to do is to merge together uh, the environmental justice movement, the social justice uh, movement, uh, the health justice, uh, uh, and the racial justice movement, because these are all so highly correlated, mm -hmm. and and create a, a, a society that uh, gives everybody uh, real opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, Carlos Lopez, let me come to you, because it's not all bad news, because earlier this year, during the pandemic, South Korea's government won a landslide election victory on a platform that actually promised a Green New Deal. So do you think that these kind of policies could actually become an electoral asset? Could you see an African government campaign, uh, an African party campaigning on that basis? Uh, I see certainly uh, the confluence of the different uh, inequalities in the discussion being a mobilizing factor politically. We have a very young population quite exposed to international media and now with the advent of social media very well connected amongst themselves. The civil society movement is now benefiting from you know these capacities to network that didn't exist before. So the consciousness about uh, climate is quite high but translated into specifics. Like, for instance, the issue of mobility is very, very high on the agenda because of the urban population not being able to move around easily. And if you have to, uh, you know, mobilize this uh, population for something very concrete, uh, offer uh, mobility uh, modalities that are respectful of the environment, this will be extremely popular. Mm. And some countries have done that, like in Cote d'Ivoire, in uh, Ethiopia, in Rwanda, you have these platforms being proposed by politicians. So it's not completely uh, outside the, the discussion right now. Mm. But I think there is another element that I think it's important to underline, is that Africa has been quite innovative in some areas of uh, uh, technology, uh, the areas that allow for frugal utilization and innovation, and it has demonstrated a capacity to leapfrog because of the young uh, population that it, uh, it actually has uh, and will increase. So what uh, normally uh, is associated as backwardness, you know, the fact that Africa doesn't have the same infrastructure, uh, namely uh, digital infrastructure that other parts of the world, is, is an opportunity for investment because the crisis has, all, has also demonstrated uh, a willingness of all governments to invest on responses that were, you know, as quick as possible. And a lot of them, particularly in the areas of services, uh, were digital and were using new technologies. And Africa leapfrogged in a number of these areas quite significantly during the crisis. So on sticking on the subject of uh, solutions, Joe Stiglitz, all over the world, central banks' mandates are currently set up to target inflation. Here in the UK, there's been a discussion about changing that to targeting nominal GDP. But I wonder, do you think there's scope to include climate change in some way in a central bank's mandate? Well, actually, most central banks has a part of their mandate, uh, financial stability. And one concern that many of us have is that uh, if we don't get climate change under control, there will be large amounts of stranded assets. Uh, that is, coal assets are going to go down to value zero. The market values them far higher than zero. And if that change from their current value to uh, their longer value occurs in a very short span of time, it would be very desta destabilizing for uh, the financial uh, uh, for our economy. So uh, assessing carbon risk is really important, an important part of the mandate of central banks. Uh, and so some countries like New Zealand have already mandated that all corporations disclose their carbon risk. So I think this is a sort of a model that all countries ought to be moving towards, the disclosure of a mandatory disclosure of climate risk and central banks need to look at it from a systemic point of view uh, 
any single firm look, can look at it from its own point of view. But what worries uh, many of us is the systemic consequences, uh, because carbon is a, a, a carbon risk is a systemic risk. Well, now it's time to open up the discussion to questions from journalists around the world. We'll start with the Nikkei in Japan. What's your name and question, please? Hi. My name is Kodaira. Uh, I'm a journalist for the Nihon Keizai Shinbun. Uh, especially, I'm covering the finance. And uh, nowadays, uh, I have written a lot about the uh, ESG or climate change and etc. cetera. Uh, about 99% uh, of our articles nowadays uh, is about the climate relating or ESGs. And uh, my, uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to uh, hear the good argument. And it provided me with a good insight for my uh, article. And uh, may I confirm uh, very, very simple things after hearing the uh, lots of arguments. Uh, what is the most important uh, thing to make the uh, uh, green recovery successful? Carlos Lopez, let's put that to you. Well, I think uh, political commitment certainly comes to mind because you will not be able to actually uh, mobilize what it takes in terms of uh, interventions for uh, a green recovery without very strong public hand. Uh, and this has been admitted. The, the orthodoxy that didn't recognize the role of the state in promoting some of this uh, type of changes is now completely uh, um, uh, forgotten. And we have now all embraced the need for a very strong public intervention. So political commitment is very important. If you happen to be in a country with a very large stimulus package uh, dedicated to the post COVID-19 recovery without that type of interest in the green uh, type of solutions or in the carbon, uh, low carbon solutions, you are not going to get what, it, uh, what is necessary for, for the transformation. Mm. And Mary Robinson, let's put that to you. What's the most important element to making a green recovery successful? I agree with uh, Carlos that it is political commitment. And I must say, uh, you know, to the questioner from Japan, um, it is good that Japan is beginning to give some leadership. I took part in a very good panel with 88 government representatives very recently um, with uh, the environment minister K Kosumi, um, who uh, had decided to try to provide a platform in the absence of uh, maybe the UK, um, which has the leadership, the presidency in preparation for COP26. Um, we haven't seen the UK step up enough, in my view, and Japan stepped up in that way. These are the kind of initiatives that we need. Governments can't do it alone. They need um, the investment community, they need business, they need philanthropy, they need civil society, they need the pressure of all the movements for justice that we've been talking about. But they are very important. And Joseph Stiglitz, what's the most important element to make a green recovery successful? Well, I agree with everything that's been said so far, but let me add uh, a couple of specifics. Uh, I think there has to be a vision, uh, a green vision in the allocation of funds, and there have to be conditions imposed on all the recipient of funds. I mentioned the example, for instance, if you're going to give money to, to the airlines, you have to say, you have to have a smaller carbon footprint. Uh, in the case of Japan, I say one thing more. Uh, you know, Japan, before the uh, pandemic, was uh, worried about uh, the size of its national debt. And uh, numerous times it's proposed an increase of the sales tax in order to uh, put its uh, fiscal position in better order. And every time it happens, it dampens the economy. And obviously, right now, this is not the time to dampen the economy. I've consistently said a much better approach than increasing the sales tax, which discourages economic activity, uh, put a carbon tax. A carbon tax will encourage firms to make investments to retrofit uh, the economy towards a green economy. It provides incentives. So it's actually part of a, a package that can help stimulate the economy. So at, next time that go, Japan needs to think about uh, how to get its fiscal house in order, think about a carbon tax 
as part of a green recovery. And what can environmental measures do that non-environmental measures can struggle to do in Japan, for example, Joseph Stiglitz? Well, I mean, I, obviously, uh, the, the broad package of infrastructure that we've talked about, but Japan is in a unique position. They've, they've made a lot of investments in infrastructure uh, more than a lot of other uh, countries. Uh, they, they have uh, uh, challenges in uh, moving towards more renewable energy. Uh, they were very affected by the, the nuclear uh, power uh, accident. Uh, but they have a lot of scope for renewable energy. Um, and obviously, they also have uh, a lot of scope, I think, for uh, investments that restructure uh, real estate uh, to make it uh, uh, better aimed at uh, reducing the carbon footprint. Useful advice for the incoming Japanese Prime Minister there. Now let's go to our second journalistic questioner who is from Sinecorp. Could you please uh, tell us your name and give us your question? Good morning. Uh, I'm Catherine Tong from Sina, North America. Thank you for offering this opportunity. My question is, how long will it take the United States to return to the economic level before the pandemic? What factors are needed to have the growth? And what industries will first recover? Mm. Well, let's, um, let's stick with Joe Stiglitz on this one. Um, how long, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, do you think it will take before the level of US GDP is back up to where it was before the pandemic uh, crisis hit, do you think? Well, I don't want to sound like a two-handed economist, but I will answer it uh, on the one hand and on the other. It all depends on the election. Uh, the Republicans have made a commitment uh, not to help the economy. Uh, they have said, uh, we're not going to extend unemployment insurance in the way that it needs. They're not going to help the state and local governments. Uh, they're uh, not going to extend the other assistance that our economy really, really needs. They're not going to help our knowledge institutions, our research institutions, our institutions of higher education, which are really in very difficult shape, our schools that need to retrofit themselves to handle the pandemic. So if Trump continues, I think we will not see ourselves back to where we were at the beginning of 2020, or the end of 2019, for years to come. The damage will be very, very deep. If Vice President Biden gets elected president, uh, I am much more hopeful. Uh, and I am very hopeful that there will be a green recovery. So it will be the assistance that the economy needs, constrained obviously uh, by reality, but there will be that assistance that the economy needs. And we will, at the same time, be working to achieve social and economic justice, racial justice, but also environmental justice, so that it will be a green recovery. We, his model has been build back better, and I think that's exactly right. And I wonder, Mary Robinson, if we could think about that question from a European context. Would you, are you more optimistic that activity and unemployment can get back to pre-crisis levels quicker in Europe because of the Green Deal? It's an interesting question because we don't want to get back to where we were. Let's remember that. We want to get back to a build back better, as Joe was saying. We want to actually change things, use this opportunity, because, you know, COVID has disrupted the uh, business as usual. It has taught us, I think, four lessons that I can just briefly outline. First of all, that collective human behavior matters because that's what's protecting us from the virus. And we need collective human behavior now to decide on um, less consumption, less production of wasteful goods, less waste, more circular economy. They have to be decisions that we all contribute to going forward. Secondly, government matters. And if you'll forgive me, I would point out that women-led governments have done particularly well in coping with COVID because they took tough decisions early and listens to the science. And that's the third thing, science matters. 
uh, you see governments side by side with their health experts planning the phases for coming out of COVID. We need climate scientists up there being listened to and being taken seriously as the children have begged us to do. And, fourth, and fourthly, it's a subtle one, but actually compassion matters. I'm seeing more neighborliness, more concern for those who are worse off because we're all out of our comfort zone. Um, it's not equal. Uh, COVID-19 actually exacerbates the inequalities, but we're all disrupted and we are more, we have more empathy and we will need that empathy for African countries in the way that Carlos was talking about, but also um, within our own communities, the inequalities that are there. We need to focus on more emphasis on the well-being, on the strengthening health systems, on the things that matter when you're alone, you know, home with your family. What really matters is education of children. It's having um, old people not dying prematurely because of contact with young people because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's all of these um, issues that have to do with human life and actually, frankly, human rights. Mm. And Carlos Lopez, how optimistic or pessimistic are you uh, about the prospects for Africa's short-term economic recovery from this? Well, uh, you see, it, it matters what the elections in the US are going to, to produce. Because, you know, the, the way uh, trade negotiations are uh, uh, taking shape right now, uh, we have been discussing the door round, which was supposed to give the development dimension a bit of space for about 17 years without any results. And now we have a protectionist attitude coming back big time. Uh, we have also the way uh, the dollar uh, behaves uh, influencing deterioration of the African currencies. So, uh, these are two examples of how Africa suffers from global trends and global economic governance in a systemic way. And therefore, it is very important for us what is going to happen in those elections and other very important developments in the world that are likely to influence the behavior of not just investors, but also some of these characteristics that I have mentioned that are going to shape the fortunes of Africa one way or another. If we want to get out of the commodities uh, dependency and we have uh, about 80% uh, of our uh, exports coming from uh, uh, commodities, we will have to have a bit of space, systemic, uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, changes are going to create or not that space. And therefore we are really very uh, worried about uh, developments post-COVID not uh, taking Africa into account one way or another, because all this liquidity, these packages, uh, negative interest rates for rich countries, and all these developments are going to make our capital fly even more to uh, more uh, secure uh, locations, which is already happening, is disrupting value chains and supply chains that were fragile in Africa. So all these uh, different developments are announcing a much more severe post-COVID uh, recovery for us than for the rest of the world. We've got a question now from France, from Say magazine. What's your name in question? Yes, hello. This, I'm Jean Rognetta, and uh, Say is going to be the French edition of Project Syndicate's magazines. I'd like to echo what Carlos Lopez just said about the dollar. Um, in the sustainability issue that is published today in English, uh, you will find some very radical proposals for green recovery, including from Anne Petitfort, uh, if my memory serves me right. The idea of replacing um, the dollar as a reserve currency with a synthetic hegemonic currency, an idea that was uh, advocated by Mark Kearney before he left the Bank of England also, essentially a basket of central bank digital currencies. Now, the question is, do we need to go so far as replacing the dollar as a reserve currency? And more general, generally, um, in order to succeed to be both green and a recovery, how radical do you think the changes to the system need to be? Carlos Lopez, what's your view? Well, sometimes when you are in a crisis mode, uh, you gain a debate rather than you solve the problem. 
Uh, I certainly believe that when we were discussing the UN global agenda in 2015, we gained the debate about taxation and the importance of taxation, although there was complete disagreement on how to tackle it. And I think right now we have a certain number of debates emerging as a result of the crisis, and we are unlikely to solve them now, but we are gaining these debates and the space to actually discuss alternative solutions for some of the systemic dimensions that I was referring to. Uh, I certainly believe very strongly that the way we are dealing, for instance, with public debt is going to be the subject of a very large uh, discussion and change because it has become a world problem, not as it was touted for a long time, a developing country's problem. And Joseph Stiglitz, what do you think? Well, this was actually a recommendation I, uh, that I, uh, I, I chaired a commission that was appointed by the, the president of the UN after the 2008 uh, crisis. And one of our recommendations, strong recommendations, that was endorsed actually by uh, the UN General Assembly was the creation of a uh, new global reserve currency. Uh, I think it would add a lot to the stability of the uh, international financial system and uh, help uh, the developing countries. But on the question about whether if we can't go all that way, and that's going to be difficult, is there something that goes a lot of the way? And the answer is yes. Uh, we already have a framework that is very similar to that in what are called uh, special drawing rights, SDRs, within uh, the IMF. And uh, the head of the IMF has called for a special issuance of $500 billion of these special drawing rights. Uh, there is a bill in the U.S. Congress uh, to expand the special drawing rights by an amount of $2 trillion. Uh, there are initiatives uh, that I've been part of, of trying to encourage uh, the more developed countries uh, who don't need these funds to contribute uh, their, what they receive in special drawing rights towards the developing countries, uh, either in loans or grants. So there is a framework that we already have. Uh, the only thing stopping the issuance of the $500 billion right now is the U.S. Secretary of Treasury. And it is a total mystery why the U.S. is not supporting it. It doesn't cost our taxpayers anything. Uh, it, it is uh, just inexplicable why we can't do something that would help others that at, at essentially zero or very low cost uh, to ourselves. Uh, so again, it's something that I hope uh, after the election will be at, at the top uh, of the agenda. Now, one more thing I want to mention, which is uh, the G20 called for a stay on official debt for the least developed countries. That was a move in the right direction, but it's clearly not enough. Uh, a lot of the emerging markets are going to have a problem. And a lot of the debt today is private debt. And the private creditors have shown themselves uh, very uncooperative. Uh, they've refused to deal with the problems of African debt and restructure the debt. So what we need now is a, a restructuring, not just a stay. Uh, the magnitude of the downturn is being so massive that uh, there will need to be, for many of the countries, a very deep restructuring okay. of the debt. And the advanced countries have to stimulate that. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much. That's unfortunately all we have time for for now. But thank you so much to our guests, Mary Robinson, Joseph Stiglitz and Carlos Lopez. Don't forget, if you'd like to join the conversation or help share the word over the next two days, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Now, don't go anywhere. We'll be taking a short break, but before our second and final session of the day, where we'll be looking at what we can do to stop the alarming loss of biodiversity. We'll be hearing from another former Colombian president and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Juan Manuel Santos, along with Anne-Larie Gaudery, Jennifer Morris, Christiana Figueres and Johan Rockström in what looks to be another fascinating discussion. We'll see you then, and thanks very much for watching and sharing.
if we respect the environment, it will respect us. So we all have to play our part. We were really in trouble of losing some species in my lifetime. And this can wreak havoc on the balance of the ecosystem. People need nature. And people must take care of nature. I am part of the next generation that has to make sure that this place survives. It is our responsibility as the two leggeds to try to foster good relationships with the herd. And it's beginning now.
Hello and welcome back to The Green Recovery, brought to you by Project Syndicate. I'm Ben Chu. And I'm Lizzie Burden. Over the next hour and a bit, we'll be looking at the alarming loss of biodiversity around the planet in today's final session, The Return of Nature. Now, yesterday, the United Nations published the Global Diversity Outlook 5, a landmark report which warns of unprecedented biodiversity loss. In a few minutes, we'll be hearing about that threat and how it might be overcome from Juan Manuel Santos, former president of Colombia and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Then we'll be joined by our highly distinguished panel, Anne Lahigaudery, chair of IPBUS, the intergovernmental science policy platform which was set up to improve the interface between science and policy on this issue. Jennifer Morris, the chief executive of the Nature Conservancy, one of the world's largest environmental organizations which boasts more than a million members. Christiana Figueres, a former executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And Johan Rockström, director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research, one of the world's leading research centers on environmental issues. But before we begin, let's remind ourselves of what's at stake. Now, if you'd like to join the conversation or help share the word over the next two days, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Here's Juan Manuel Santos, former president of Colombia and winner of the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize, who currently works with the elders. It is an honor for me to open this vitally important discussion. COVID-19 has brought into sharp focus the connection between people and nature. Our well-being is dependent on healthy, vibrant ecosystems. My home country, Colombia, is the second most biodiverse nation in the world, but also one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. But Colombia does not stand in isolation. No nation does. COVID-19 has reaffirmed our global interdependence. It is because of an understanding of our shared humanity that we have the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. These global agreements should act as a guiding light, but the gap between the vision laid out in these frameworks and our current behavior is huge. We continue to ignore the science. And even now, we are falling short on the action needed to avoid catastrophe. There is no pathway to a safe climate which does not also involve significant upscaling of nature-based solutions. Global warming is the third biggest factor driving species extinction. Healthy ecosystems are vital in the Earth's ability to absorb CO2. As much as 37% of the cost-effective carbon emissions reductions needed to meet the Paris Agreement can come from the natural climate solutions of stopping deforestation, restoring degraded lands, and better managing the way we use land. A true green recovery cannot, cannot leave behind the communities connected to the ecosystems we seek to protect. We have failed to learn lessons from indigenous people who for centuries have lived 
in harmony with nature as guardians of our biodiversity. Together with fellow members of the elders, I have been calling for the ratification of the Escazú Agreement, an historic treaty guaranteeing environmental rights for communities in Latin America and the Caribbean, and providing special protections for environmental human rights defenders. Most remaining poverty in the world is located in rural areas. Recovery investments should target natural climate solutions. These will reduce the risk of future pandemics, tackle climate change, and simultaneously provide rural jobs and incomes for the people in greatest need. Nature-based solutions and the protection of biodiversity are not, are not a substitute for accelerating the phase out of fossil fuels. Restoration of nature must not be used as an excuse to continue taking carbon out of the ground. We must see the end of fossil fuel use alongside the revolution in nature-based solutions if we are to truly build back a safer and a fairer world. Thank you. That was Juan Manuel Santos, former president of Colombia. Now, in about half an hour, we'll be hearing from questions around the world from journalists. But first, I'd like to start with you, Anne Larry Gaudery. Your organization published a paper on this just last year that found that nature is being eroded at rates unprecedented in human history. Explain to us what's disappearing and why so rapidly. Are we reaching a tipping point today? Thank you very much. Well, your uh, little movie uh, showed many uh, of uh, the numbers that came out of the uh, IBIS Global Assessment uh, that came out uh, last year. And the report uh, concluded with one of these numbers which have really become uh, emblematic uh, around the world with this 1 million species of plants and animal out of about 8 million uh, threatened with uh, extinction. But the report came up uh, with many uh, other numbers uh, showing that uh, we are losing uh, biodiversity. It showed really uh, that the planet is uh, almost entirely uh, under human uh, domination. It, for example, showed that only 3% of our ocean area can still be considered as wild, or like 75% of the land uh, area is uh, degraded to uh, severely degraded, and it, it gave many other numbers. It also concluded that, as your movie also uh, quickly uh, showed, that that has an impact on the contributions uh, that we derive from nature, going to uh, material contributions, uh, to immaterial contributions, our culture, our sense of identity, uh, the value we place uh, in particular uh, locations, but also into a, an array of what we call this uh, regulating contributions uh, on which uh, human life on Earth depends. That's the capacity of ecosystems to pollinate so that we uh, then obtain crops, or the capacity of ecosystem to regulate our climate, or the capacity of our ecosystems to regulate air quality, uh, for example. But also uh, the report came up with solutions, and perhaps we will be talking about that as well. We definitely will. Johan Rockström, I wonder if I can turn to you. Would you say we're reaching a tipping point? We have uh, many tipping points to be concerned of. Just before COVID-19 crisis broke out, we published the 10-year update on the tipping points in the Earth system. And we show that nine of the 15 known big tipping point <laughs> systems are, are on the move. They are showing a tendency of either slowing down, increased variability, or accelerated change. Among these nine, you have the temperate forest, the tropical forest, the coral reef systems, the big overturning of heat in the biophysical systems in the ocean, Arctic ice melt, and West Antarctic ice melt. And we show that these systems are interconnected. So the latest science, for example, shows that 
if we continue to lose trees in the Amazon rainforest, today we've lost 17%. If we approach a point of 20% loss, combine that with global warming, combine that with ocean circulation slowdown, which is feeding more forest fires and drought, we risk crossing a tipping point. So we're not far away from known tipping points in terms of the latest scientific knowledge we have today, but we haven't crossed them yet. We have this, this decisive decade in front of us where we need to start truly bending the curves on both emission reductions and reduce loss of biodiversity to be able to deviate away from crossing tipping points. Mm. And Christiana Figueres, you have a background as an anthropologist. Is human behaviour essentially opposed to biodiversity? Or what are the kinds of human behaviour that are causing this? Well, um, at first glance, one would say, yes, human behavior is opposed to biodiversity. I've never heard that term, but it's an interesting concept to consider for a moment um, because, of course, we have created so much damage. But we have to remember that we humans simply wouldn't exist without our natural environment. Where do we get every breath of air? from our biomass that surrounds us? Where do we get every drop of water from nature? Where do we get every morsel of food from nature? Um, and so, you know, to say that we're opposed to nature would basically be we're opposed to our own survival. And, and, and I think that's what we have to realize, that uh, we have actually been pushing the resilience of nature to almost to breaking points, as Johan has just described. And uh, it behooves us to stand back, realize that we are at the brink of completely undermining our existence on this planet. Because this is not about saving the planet. The planet has been around for 4.5 billion years, and she's perfectly capable to con of continuing to evolve without us. This is about saving the very, very important and delicate sweet spot of conditions on planet Earth that have allowed the human race to benefit, to thrive, to propagate. That's what this is all about. And to do so, we have to understand that we do, literally, not figuratively, literally, we depend on that natural context in order to be able to continue living, in order to be able to survive. So yes, the tipping points in the different ecosystems are critical, but they are even more critical when you realize that they are a direct threat to the continuation of the human race. Without exaggeration, it does sound like an exaggeration, but it isn't. And the only way that we're gonna be able to do this is in this decisive decade to cut our greenhouse gas emissions globally in by 50% by 2030 and to get to 30% of, uh, of our land on planet Earth to be restored and regenerated. And, and the thing is, we can do this because we have the technologies, we have the capital, we have the science, we know what the policies are. We can do this. So what we really need to bridge here is the willingness to act in a timely fashion gap. That is the gap that we have to address. And Jennifer Morris, your organization works with indigenous communities in the Amazon and the United States, among others. What impact has the environmental degradation had on those people? So it's been absolutely devastating as we see the news reports from Brazil, all over the world, um, indigenous people and, and communities without savings, without really a lifeline are being first impacted. Um, there's no more regressive issue on planet Earth than climate change and biodiversity loss. It hits those communities first and foremost. So I completely agree with what Christiana was just saying about our need to redefine how humans connect with nature. We have to be valuing nature in a way that we've never done before. And that requires a concerted effort. And if we think about what we have been able to do with respect to COVID, the World Health Organization has said very clearly the most important way that we can prevent a future pandemic 
and to ensure a just recovery is that we protect nature. So we know when we all come together, we can do this. We know, in fact, that to actually prevent another pandemic, it will cost us less than 3% of what we're spending on the current recovery from COVID. So with investments now to prevent the tipping points that Johan just mentioned, to prevent the loss of the very fabric of our planet that keeps humans healthy, we need to invest now. And we need to recognize in particular that things like harmful subsidies are absolutely killing our planet and ultimately killing us. So we have to address those and we have to address those now. And Johan Rockström, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US, the CDC, estimate that three quarters of new or emerging diseases that infect humans originate in animals. To what extent is COVID related to diminishing biodiversity in your opinion? Yeah, I would say it's not my opinion. This is what uh, more and more uh, scientific evidence shows. If you just look over the past 20 years, the number of zoonotic viral spillovers, meaning you have virus infections spilling over from wildlife through domestic animals to humans, have increased dramatically. And this is exactly the same time period when we, as President Santos pointed out, as Anne pointed out, have been unsustainably exploiting natural habitats, expanding agriculture, and having an, an unsustainable collision between humans and nature. And that is what explains the rising frequency of these viral spillovers. We also know that 75% of these zoonotic viral spillovers originate from rodents, uh, primates, and bats. And these are species that are very well tailored to survive in, in, in simplified and generalized ecosystems that are more and more dominated by humans. So when we simplify and destroy the richness and beauty of nature, we get also species that are more able to be carriers of virus. So, uh, you know, Jen is, Jennifer is absolutely right that investing in a green recovery is the best strategy of building a resilient future to avoid future pandemics. Now, don't forget to join the conversation and help share the word over the next two days. Please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Now, I want to get into a bit more detail about solutions and actually just sticking with you, uh, Johan Rockström. If you had the ear of governments around the world, what are the specific policy priorities for preventing another zoonotic pandemic like uh, coronavirus? What would you be telling them they need to do today? Well, the number one, I would uh, adopt what Jennifer Morris just said, that we've put 11 trillion US dollars on the table for the COVID-19 recovery. Only a fraction of that, like one, two trillion, would be enough to decarbonize the world economy and protect nature. So put the money on the table, withdraw all negative subsidies, number one. Number two is adopt science-based targets, like the 1.5 degree Celsius equivalent on climate, give a, a number, a science-based number for protecting nature. And that number is quite simple. I think we're merging towards a point where the number is zero, meaning that we now have to protect the remaining natural ecosystems on, on Earth as a source of everything that Christiana Figueres shared with us earlier. I think these are the two fundamentals that need to be adopted urgently. Uh, let me turn to you, uh, anne Larry Gaudery. Um, there's been a pause to much human activity during these coronavirus lockdowns. Um, what's the impact that's had that you can see on biodiversity? And does that perhaps have lessons for, for us about how we move forward? So um, in terms of biodiversity, there has been, uh, I would say, anecdotal uh, evidence regarding biodiversity that has not really been uh, analyzed yet. We've seen uh, some returns of uh, species in cities or in areas where they hadn't been seen uh, in a long time. We've also seen uh, an impact on, on carbon emission and on air quality. So all of that, of course, uh, is a positive. But what that tells us is really an important message, which is that when measures are, are uh, implemented, uh, whether willfully or not in that particular case, biodiversity does bounce back. And I guess that's the encouraging uh, message and, and, and perhaps 
even more encouraging uh, than uh, climate change, that in, in climate change, you do something and there is some inertia in the system with biodiversity, you can take measures and, and they can have relatively quick and encouraging uh, outcomes. So uh, in terms of uh, things that have been tried and that can have a really uh, a positive uh, outcome, We've seen, for example, from uh, the IBES reports that uh, invasive species can be quickly eradicated uh, if measures are put in place, that conservation and protection, protected areas do work, and they can save uh, a lot of extinctions of species. Uh, for example, it's been calculated in the report that came out uh, yesterday uh, that uh, with the uh, uh, measures that have been taken since uh, the 90s, uh, 48 species of mammals have been protected from extinction, for example, but also fisheries, uh, unsustainable fisheries is, is a big uh, problem, a big source of, uh, of biodiversity loss. They can be rebuilt and where that has been tried, uh, it works. So overall, um, what this suggests is that uh, the many ways uh, that uh, had our, at our disposal can really have an impact. It's a question of will, and together we really can do it. Yeah. We bring in Christiana Figueres here. The IPBES report that Anne mentions says that intensive farming, intensive forestry, and overfishing are by far the most important drivers of biodiversity loss. Now, rich countries spend billions of dollars every year, as we've been hearing, on subsidies for fishing and farming. Presumably, do you agree with Johan that all such subsidies just need to be scrapped immediately? Well, all negative subsidies, yes, uh, those subsidies as well as subsidies on fossil fuels. Uh, we are unfortunately subsidizing those activities and those sectors that are most harming our health, uh, our personal health, our public health, and the health of the planet. So that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Even from a strict economic point of view, it just doesn't make any, uh, any sense to make those activities that are detrimental to our health and survival um, any cheaper. It sends the, absolutely the wrong economic signals. Um, and therefore, those uh, have to be scrapped, or rather, they have to be migrated over to the activities, both land-based activities as well as energy-based activities, that are still incipient, that still need somewhat of a boost in order to be able to get to commercial terms and to scale. So it is, it's not about scrapping all subsidies, it's about understanding what is the economic impact of subsidies and truly targeting that economic impact toward the solution space, both in the nature-based um, and na nature-based uh, solutions as well as in the energy-based solutions. Well, let me ask you, uh, Anne Larry Godery, about the population question. There, there is a projected rise in global population over this century. Some would say that we need to accept that large scale intensive farming is necessary to feed humanity. Do you agree with that, or is there another way? So, there are uh, many ways that uh, we have at our disposal to really uh, improve uh, our food systems, and that's really one of the key. A transformative change uh, that needs to take place uh, moving forward to as part of an important solution to biodiversity loss. So uh, we, uh, and one of the uh, important uh, components of this change uh, in uh, our food system is the need to move towards more sustainable diets uh, that rely less uh, on animal proteins and, and thus uh, requiring less land, less deforestation to make space for more uh, cattle, as is currently uh, proposed, and to really rely more uh, on uh, proteins that come uh, from plants. But uh, we also need to uh, decrease our wastes. Currently, uh, about a third of the food that is produced goes uh, to waste uh, at different places of the production, including at the consumption level. So that is really one of the um, ac actions that uh, every individual can take uh, to uh, preserve our biodiversity. But more largely, our agriculture also uh, needs to also evolve towards more uh, sustainable pathways itself. 
uh, beyond uh, the cattle, uh, which you pointed out, uh, in particular, our way to farm. Uh, we need to move towards more agroecological practices. We know how to, that, to do that. Where it's done, it works. We need to move away from the use of pesticides and the overutilization of, of fertilizers. They are both sources of pollution and of important losses of biodiversity around the world. They, for example, lead to the loss of pollinators. Uh, we also need to promote uh, genetic diversity. You may know that we've been losing 10% of all of the uh, different types of varieties of uh, animals, different types of sheep, of crops that had been uh, selected over hundreds of years by people that were uh, adapted to local conditions, which are really crucial now in the context of climate change, and we are losing those. So all of that is part of the food system, the yeah. agriculture, and that's one of the main uh, actions that people can take to yeah. uh, as part of the solution. Yeah, let me bring uh, Jennifer Morris in here. Um, Jennifer, is it possible to reduce uh, intensive farming without hurting the livelihoods of small farmers, small scale farmers, who of course are some of the poorest people on earth? Is that possible in your view? Yes, absolutely. And, and part of it goes back to the, um, the transition of subsidies, clearly. Um, it also has a lot to do with how we invest in smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers are often much less productive per unit of crop per acre or hectare than large farmers. Um, but there are some very simple techniques that the Nature Conservancy and many, many other organizations around the world are employing to improve the productivity of the farms um, for smallholders. And, and just a, a, one example, this whole idea of regenerative agriculture, um, it's only gonna work bringing life back to land on smallholder farms, as well as larger farms, if we address the subsidy question and if we transition and value products, food products, um, protein sources that actually are grown on lands that are regenerating the planet as opposed to depleting it. So it's a multifaceted approach, but to really invest in smallholder farmers, it's going to take us all coming together and saying to our leaders, we want to eat food that's grown on land that's good for planet Earth, and we want to ensure that smallholder farmers are able to grow land in a way, grow food on land in a way that increases its productivity. But we also need to make sure that they can get a piece of the pie and right now most of the agricultural subsidies are going to these large farmers and we're talking about 300 billion dollars a year in subsidies in forestry agriculture um, that actually harm the environment so we have to address that and that's the only way we're going to ensure that smallholder farmers can also grow land grow crops on land that's productive and good for planet earth well, it's not long now until we'll be taking questions from journalists around the world. But before that, I want to get more into the obstacles to solving this issue. Christiana Figueres, in 2010, the Aishi Biodiversity Target set out 20 objectives to be met by the end of 2020, but they've still not been reached. You've had success in negotiating a climate change agreement, but what are the obstacles to getting to that point, as well as to ensuring that the commitment remains after an agreement signed? Well, unfortunately, there are quite a few obstacles. One is the absence of a very compelling and this we're talking about we're only just beginning to develop. Um, the other is the very, very ex a distributed nature of these activities. They to do the work we're talking about mobilizing and retraining and reorganizing um, millions of people around the world as opposed to in the energy sector where you have a few large energy companies uh, to work with. But actually, I think the biggest barrier is what I would call a very dangerous mental hangover. And that is the mental hangover that we're still holding on to the thought that investing in nature-based solutions is by definition cheating, that it is by definition greenwashing, that by definition companies that invest in nature-based solutions have no 
uh, positive intent with that, that they're only cheating on climate and cheating on their emission reductions. We have to get over that. We have to be mature about that. It is a very infantile thought to think that it is, by definition, a cheating activity. I will not deny that, of course, there is a temptation to, um, to manipulate numbers or to put more intent on one side than the other. But the fact is that as a planet, we need to do both. We need to reduce emissions and from the energy side and about 70% and about 30% has to come from these nature-based solutions. And we have to be able to do both. It's not that doing one is cheating on the other. And most corporations today understand that and are very sincerely engaging in these nature-based solutions in order to help us get where we need to go. Because the fact is, if you look at these nature-based solutions on their own, standing on their own, without even any climate considerations, we've already talked about how beneficial they are for biodiversity, for aquifer um, protection, for income of the people who live around there, for better soil productivity, for the regeneration of our planet, on and on and on. Many benefits that we are to derive from these activities. On top of that, you overlay that with climate, and these are the activities that allow us to take carbon um, dioxide out of the air and put carbon in soil where it belongs, relocate carbon out of the air, out of the atmosphere, and back into the soil and into biomass where it belongs. And that is going to help climate change. So we, first of all, we, we should do these things anyway because they are, they are incredibly beneficial on their own. But the irony is when we do them, we also benefit climate change. So we have to get over this mentality that investing in nature-based solutions is, has no integrity and that it is a greenwashing, that it is a cheap to put, obviously, the monitoring and the rigor in place to ensure that we're doing things correctly. But we have to realize that just like we have a right and a left hand, we need and nature-based solutions. Uh, do you believe in this myth of greenwashing or what are the main obstacles in your view? Is it mostly a matter of political will? Yes, of course there is greenwashing, but yes, I believe that uh, it's a question, yes, uh, above all, uh, of uh, political will. We need to really change uh, the global uh, con conversation uh, about uh, biodiversity, the way uh, the global conversation about uh, climate has really been uh, changed. We really need to continue to make the case for biodiversity. I sense uh, that, uh, especially since the big report uh, from the best that came last year, biodiversity is upper uh, on the agenda, but much more uh, needs to be done. So we've had since that report a lot of firsts. Uh, first time the G7 spoke about the biodiversity and adopted the biodiversity charter. The G20 talked about the biodiversity. The Davos uh, also work economic forum back in this January also uh, flagged for the first time biodiversity as, as one of the first, one of the five top uh, risks for uh, businesses. So uh, the private sector is moving in and not just in, in greenwashing in terms of uh, really completely revisiting their supply chains. Uh, the public also, we, we start seeing uh, particularly young movements also demanding uh, more attention towards biodiversity like, like we've had uh, for climate. So all of that is encouraging and attitudes are starting to change, including demanding uh, elected officials to also uh, see to it that uh, things get uh, improved in terms of biodiversity outcome. But that needs to be much faster, of course. Mm. And Jennifer Morris, I want to read you a quote from Professor Kate Jones, an expert in infectious disease at University College London, speaking about the chances of another pandemic similar to COVID, which many think may have started in the wet markets of China. Speaking of Nigeria, she says, 
The wet market in Lagos is notorious. It's like a nuclear bomb waiting to happen. But it's not fair to demonize places which do not have fridges. These traditional markets provide much of the food for Africa and Asia. Do you, Jennifer Morris, sympathize with those remarks? Well, there's, I certainly agree that they are time bombs, as we know. Um, we know that a lot of, as, as Johan rightly mentioned, a lot of these places um, are causing the zoonotic diseases that we're faced with right now. So they're undermining the economic returns of the entire planet right now. So what I would say is that while I absolutely sympathize, I think what we need to do as a global community, recognizing that we're all connected to what's happening in these wet markets, that we need to provide people living in those places who are relying on those sources of protein for more sustainable access, whether that is providing them with the ability to freeze food, the ability to raise chickens and other poultry and other types of protein that's a little bit lower on the food chain, and certainly not eating biodiversity, wild animals. We have to stop doing that. I mean, we recognize that a lot of people don't have an option. If you do have an option, please eat lower on the food chain. If you don't have an option, we as a global community must help those places have access to safe and sustainable sources of protein. We recognize now how interconnected we all are to those places on the planet like never before. Every one of us sitting here in our, on Skype, this is a direct result of those wet markets. So if we can spend trillions of dollars on recovery, surely we can spend a small fraction that's needed to prevent another pandemic like we're having now and help those people who rely and need sustainable and safe sources of protein. Now, don't forget tomorrow we've got another first class lineup for you all, starting uh, with a session on whether green business is good business, with opening remarks from former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. Then closing the circuit, looking at how we can transition to green energy with opening remarks from former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and another great panel. But first, I want to get a bit more into this question about overcoming those obstacles to biodiversity protection. And I want to turn to you, Johan Rockström. Public opinion is so important in this, isn't it? We've seen an increase in public awareness of climate change in recent years. But do you think that public understanding of biodiversity diversity and its importance still lags behind somewhat? Yeah, so, so we started this conversation by you asking this, this question whether we have a kind of a re, re de degraded our relationship with nature. And um, I, I totally agree with, with Cristiano Figueres point that that is not the right framing. But I think it is correct to say that we have disconnected our modern societies from nature. We've allowed ourselves for too long to uh, believe that we can simply exploit for free, transform into consumer goods and production factors, and then waste in a, in a linear economic system downstream. And that this is shifting. And it's shifting before COVID. So this is something that we're seeing a positive momentum of recognizing through the climate agenda, but increasingly through the nature agenda. Anne is absolutely right with the IPBS report and then other scientific evidence coming forward. But I think the fundamental is Christiana's point that we now know that our only chance to have uh, uh, you know, a possibility of a livable environments with functioning life support systems on a stable planet is if we become stewards of both nature and climate as an integrated whole. We can even say today with quite strong scientific evidence that the final battleground, whether we succeed or fail, even with the Paris Climate Agreement, is no longer whether we are able to get rid of fossil fuels, it is whether we're able to keep the resilience and carbon sinks in the natural ecosystems intact. And I think this is sinking in. People are starting to feel more and more concerned and worried when you see all the forest fires and the droughts and the disease patterns across the world. And fundamentally, COVID-19 may have helped us here because people have been locked in for such a long time in particularly urban areas hitting across the whole world. And what do every people, every person does just cherish more than anything? Well, it is to have a little green space outside of your apartment or wherever you're living. And this is, uh, I think, a, a kind of a reconnection point that I hope we can utilize as a, as a recovery measure as well in our investments 
post-COVID. And Christiana Figueres, if we think about the UN Convention on Biodiversity, even if it uh, is a political and diplomatic success, isn't there a limit um, to what top-down activity can achieve? Um, would you agree with the, the fact, well, the proposition that it needs to action needs to come from consumers and voters from the bottom up as well as the top down? Well, actually, I think we've run out of time to uh, engage in the luxury of choosing between top down or bottom up. If we had decades to solve this, then maybe we could choose, but we don't. This is the decadal challenge, and those of us alive are the only ones who can begin to uh, change the course and put us back on the right track. Because by 2030, we will have substantially decided what the future is going to be. So young people today uh, will be saddled with whatever is decided now for them by the time they get to the decision table. It's going to be too late. So we, we are under a time crunch now that we have never seen before, never experienced before. What that means is, all hands on board. Every individual in our personal life has responsibilities here, both with respect to climate and with respect to nature-based solutions and, um, and the re regeneration of the earth, both of which are two sides of exactly the same coin. We have that responsibility as individuals, as heads of families, as mayors of cities, as governors of states, as heads of state of countries, as CEOs of companies, everyone, every single one. So let us not think, you know, try to export responsibility. Oh, it has to be the governments, or it has to be the corporations, or it has to be individual behavior. It's everyone. We can no longer afford to choose or to sequence the responsibility. We now have a convergence of crises like we've never had before, and we have to converge the solutions, and we have to converge the stakeholders and the actors that bring about those solutions. All hands on board. Well, now it's time to open up the conversation to our huddle of journalists. Let's start with Nexo Jornal in Brazil. What's your name and what's your question, please? Hello, I'm Camila Rocha from Nexo Jornal, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, we were having municipal elections here in November. However, environmental issues, they don't seem to be a priority in most campaigns uh, for mayor or for city councillor all around the country. We, we don't, see, don't seem to see that on the agenda. Uh, for, for instance, there's little talk about uh, investing in cycling and walking, uh, like we see that discussion in many other countries. I mean, how important is uh, the contribution of cities to the green recovery? Johan Rockström, let's throw that one to you. Fundamental. We know that 50% of the world population live in cities today, projected to reach potentially above 70% in just 30 years' time. We also know that uh, cities depend on nature equally as uh, rural populations, so it's a myth to believe that cities would be somehow disconnected from nature. Food originates, as does the stability in the environments we live in, from the functioning ecosystems surrounding cities. This is a deep concern that we do not see the, the, the momentum and engagement on uh, the nature and climate agendas um, you know, equally distributed across the world. I would even argue today that unfortunately, the only real climate leadership we have in the world today is in the European Union. And we had that announcement today from the European Commission that's aligning with science. So somehow we need to have at the highest level political discussions between leaders in, in countries like between Brazil and, and Latin American or South American countries with other leaders in the world. Because quite frankly, what we saw happening in the wet market in Wuhan in China that became a climate uh, health crisis is exactly the same risks we're facing potentially if we cross tipping points in the Amazon, which would then send invoices, which would also knock the whole economy in the world. So it's, it's exactly the same situation. We cannot accept it and we need to have a much, much closer dialogue between nations on these issues. Our next question is from uh, Olukayode Oyeleye from Business AM in Nigeria. And he wants to know, how can we overcome corruption in urban areas? I want to throw this one to you, Cristiana Figueres. Um, political corruption, does that, 
Is that one of the key um, obstacles, do you think, to taking biodiversity seriously and solving this problem? Well, unfortunately and very painfully, corruption is one of the main um, barriers to any kind of development. It's not just to, uh, to the protection of nature and to the solution of climate change. It unfortunately really is a thorn in the side of, uh, of human development, of integrity, of human rights, um, of human betterment, in fact, of even the evolution of the human race toward uh, levels. So yes, very painful. Um, and, uh, and one issue that uh, one of my totally best friends, Wanjira Matai, um, has actually been working on quite vehemently in Africa precisely, uh, because that's where she's from. Not that corruption is only prevalent in Africa, unfortunately. It's uh, found everywhere. But she has been doing really leadership work there on uh, how to minimize the tolerance for, uh, for corruption and therefore raise accountability of all types of leaders, both in the private and in the public space. But it is uh, clearly one of the things that we have to move beyond. Now, our next journalist's question uh, comes from Channel News Asia in Singapore. Can you uh, tell us your name, please, and ask your question? Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening from Singapore. It's Jamie Ho here. Uh, and I have a question which maybe will help us do our jobs a little bit better and follows from what Christiana was saying just five minutes ago. I mean, if you look at the challenges that societies face today, they're really short term, um, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's income inequality, whether it's economic job losses. With all that in mind, how do you help governments and us journalists in the media focus uh, public attention and resources on, on problems that we've spoken about just, which you know invariably are going to be seen as longer term problems, even though, as we've said, are not really longer term problems? Well, let's um, throw this one to Anne Larigaudary. Um, how do you get people to focus on long term challenges and not fixate, as we all are all prone to do, on short term challenges? How do you do it? Perhaps one important uh, element to, to, to recognize there is that even though uh, these, all of these issues may seem fragmented to uh, many people and, and perhaps to, to journalists, uh, they in fact are uh, quite related. And there are in fact many uh, situations that are win-win-win. Uh, so for example, when we talk about uh, uh, bringing back, when we talk about nature-based solution, when we talk about better managing our ecosystems in order to uh, get nature to come back, to improve the situation of biodiversity. We also uh, solve uh, a part of the climate change uh, issue, but we also uh, solve some of our health issues uh, within the current pandemic. We've seen now that there is a stronger, a strong interlinkage between forest and in particular, and uh, disturbances and uh, the uh, emergence of infectious diseases. And, and so uh, we see uh, that uh, by uh, better taking care of nature, we can also address issues that are related to climate, issues that are related to food, obviously, and also issues that are related to health. And perhaps it's, it's good to try and think about this approach that really brings uh, all of these different uh, elements uh, together. Um, another example, if you change uh, your diet uh, when that is possible uh, towards uh, a more of a plant-based diet, you not only uh, greatly contribute to uh, solving issues related to biodiversity, but also to climate change and also to your own health. So there are many examples like that of things that you can do uh, that will contribute to uh, other issues as well. Of course, it's not all like that. And that is why we, when we talk about biodiversity and climate change, we really need to think about all of these interactions because some of this land mitigation aspects in particular for climate change can harm biodiversity and food security. But perhaps we come back on that. 
Mm. And our next question comes from Euronews Living in the UK. What's your name? What's your question, please? Hi there, I'm Marta Ferrer for Euronews Living. Um, IPBES last year re released a report which highlighted that ecological decline was far less severe in areas held or managed by Indigenous peoples. So my question is, how do you think that we can place Indigenous communities in the heart of projects which are safeguarding biodiversity? Anne, we'll put that one to you. Yes, so indeed uh, the report showed that uh, a quarter of our land is uh, under some form of uh, traditional uh, management and it also showed uh, that uh, indigenous management uh, is uh, uh, slightly better and that those lands, even though they are threatened, they are in general doing better uh, than other forms of, of management. So I can tell you with an IBES, of course, and we, we have uh, uh, developed a very innovative approach, which in fact is now also studied by colleagues from, from the climate change community and we're working uh, with them on, on that uh, in order to work in our reports, also bringing indigenous and local knowledge. And, and so we have many dialogues uh, with local and indigenous communities from the very start, from the word go, when we uh, are going to have a report uh, then uh, in order to develop the questions that this report is going to address, uh, we have dialogues so that the questions are co-defined together with uh, local communities. Then we have a call for knowledge itself, and then the, those communities will contribute uh, in different, different forms. It can be narratives that we will uh, tape. It can be different forms of poetry, it can be all sorts of forms of art or, or, and also publications. And then at the end of the process, when we actually have the report itself, we go back to the communities, we say that we give back and we present the conclusions of those reports. And so everything that we do is really participative and inclusive. And the global assessment, in fact, was the first product that we did that implemented that approach fully, and that has really been well received, but also used and in those communities and it's helping them. It's also giving them scientific arguments uh, towards uh, improving uh, their situation in their own uh, territories. Mm. Our next question comes from Kamna Arora from Times Now in India. It's been written in, I'll read it for you. It says, how can rural communities help create a better normal world post COVID? Let's ask Jennifer Morris that one. Sure, well, the role of rural communities is absolutely essential. They're uh, closest to, to nature. And so as we've been discussing, it's critical that um, that communities have the incentives to preserve nature. And governments, you know, are really looking for solutions. We talk about making sure that all governments include the value of natural capital in their economic plans, but they're also asking, okay, well, we recognize that, but how do we do it? And I just wanna highlight a paper that's coming out tomorrow, the Nature Conservancy, the Paulson Institute and Cornell, Cornell University have come up with a series through lots of research and analysis of nine points of how governments the private sector, um, communities, NGOs, all of us together can actually address the large biodiversity financing gap for our economies. So I really think this is a, a, a groundbreaking paper that will help us to figure out the clear ways, both short term and long term, that we can address the something like $700 billion per year in the financing gap we need to ensure that biodiversity is maintained and remains the underpinning of human health as well as the natural world. Well, Jennifer Morris, can you go into more detail on that for us, please? What is the role of finance here? Sure, the role of finance is, is critically important. And the specifically in how we look at what investments we're making, we mentioned subsidies before, but there's also the investment in um, the things that are actually destroying nature, which happen on a, a very regular basis. So how do we create the incentives and the value systems within the finance sector? And that's it's partially coming from shareholders. It's coming who, who want a better world, who want to see the investments that they're investing in actually restore instead of deplete nature. And it's coming from, from the youth and employees and consumers 
who really are pushing these companies and these governments to make investments in a different way. And I'm really excited about some of the formal things that are happening in the banking industry specifically. Um, Mark Carney, who's been a real leader in this space, who's actually calling for regulation on, on in valuing how nature is incorporated into investment portfolios. This is one step in the, exactly the right direction, and we need to see that from all regions and all countries if we're going to make a change. Are you confident in the steps that the world of finance is taking in this area? Are you optimistic about them? Well, I'm not, I'm not yet convinced that uh, we have the financial institutions behind us in full, but, uh, but Jennifer is absolutely on spot here. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the tap where everything begins. I mean, this is if we want to get transformative change, remembering that we are at this planetary urgency point, we need to bend the global curves of loss of nature. We need to cut emissions by half over the next 10 years globally. That's a transformation. The financial flows must be redirected from investing in fossil fuels and destroying nature to recovering nature and renewable energy systems. I mean, this is that that's the pivotal point. So so I don't I don't yet see the scaling here, but but Mark Carney, for example, and we have uh, actors like BlackRock coming out much more openly in support of uh, seeing not for uh, for environmental purposes, but fundamentally for you know on pure business grounds showing that investments in um, in green renewable energy systems and nature aligned investments give a better long term profitability so this is this is an exciting moment in that sense i mean that that's a that's the green race that we are seeing emerging and that we want to uh, want to join well, um, that's unfortunately all we have time for now. But I think if one thing has come through in this session, it's that we do not have the luxury of time. Um, but thank you so much to our guests uh, for joining us. Don't forget, if you'd like to join the conversation or help share the word over the next two days, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Joe Coburn will be hosting tomorrow's session. So for now, it's goodbye from me, Lizzie Burden. And from me, Ben Chu. Thanks so much for watching.